Good afternoon, everyone, to Session Spotlight. We're excited to have more of our leaders for convergence. We're going to have Adrian Gaskell today, Jenny Hockey, Ellen Hess, Beth Ross Johnson, Laura Salemi, Angela Schneider, Rachel Snack, and Sydney Sogol. So thank you all for joining us. Just a reminder, Convergence is July the 11th through the 17th. Uh, we'll be in Wichita, Kansas. It's an international fiber art conference and it is packed full of different things. We've got the marketplace. Everybody loves to shop. We have the most exciting exhibits, juried exhibits. They're amazing. The Runway Fashion Show, which is the highlight of the week. Keynote speakers, tours, and so much more. Today, we're gonna to start with Adrian Gaskell. Inside Out Kumi Hemo. It's a one-day workshop and it's Friday, July the 12th. Hey, Adrian. Hi, how are you? I'm good. It's have, good to have you here. Love your background. Oh, thank you. It's much nicer than my messy studio. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy to talk about this project because this is something that I just taught in Japan to the Kumihimo Society in Japan. And it was just such a fun thing for everybody there because usually they're used to doing just fiber braids. And even though they're all very experienced, this was very new to them to combine the beaded elements in with a fiber braid to give it more dimension and a layered look. And one of the things I love, love, love about this project is how everybody's project looks different. Even though I'm teaching this as a technique, I bring lots of different beads and other materials so that people can create their own uh, design. And basically just everybody's looks different. It, they all reflect each individual's artistic taste. And it's just fun for me to see what people combine. I don't really um, orchestrate what they should use. I give them advice on what beads work, but people pick their own things. Often I think, oh my gosh, I would have never put that together and it turns out fabulous. So that's always, you know, exciting things for an instructor to get that kind of result in a class. So I can show you a few more. I know the uh, project uh, on the website only has one photograph and I don't want people to think that's the only thing being offered. So would it be okay if I shared my screen and showed a few more photos? That would be great. Okay, so let me go here. <clears throat> so these are some other braids. Oh, wait, let me play. Let's see if I got it. You got me? Yeah, we got you. Those are gorgeous. So these are some other braids. This is the one that's on the uh, picture for the class, but this is another one I recently made, which I love the whole look of black with gold and silver. And I threw in a few Keshi pearls on this one. This is actually a braid here. The pink one is from a student that they did. And so you can see how different these three look, right? And then um, these are the braids that my jet one some of my Japanese students made a few weeks ago. So again, you can see, although they're all fairly similar in the size braid, the size beads, they really have completely different looks. And they just did such a great job. I love seeing how they did that. And one of the other things I'm developing now with a lot of my classes is how to um, not only make these braids on a Mara die, the traditional Japanese equipment, but how to make these more accessible to people that you know don't have that equipment. And so I'm um, coming up with ways to do these with a disc on a stand. And so this is something that's not normally available and I'm working on that. So the students in the class will not only, you know, use their traditional Maradai equipment, but they'll see how they can take this and make it a little more portable and do it a little different technique. So this class is not for the baby beginner. This is a class that someone who has done some uh, work before, and then also they need a Maradai, correct? 
Yeah. And um, what I'd like to do is if someone doesn't have a Mara dye, I have lots of Mara dye. And so I'll bring some. So I should have put that in my class description that I would be able to offer Mara dye for loan. Um, and so that's something else that um, if someone has used a Mara dye but is not able to bring one, they could um, ask for a loaner. Okay. And also um, the Convergence uh, Marketplace will be open by then if they're interested and maybe they want a brand new one or a better one for your class, you know, they will, you, they could go ahead and buy one before they come. And can they contact you if they need to discuss with you what kind of Mori dye and the materials? Sure. Of course. I always love to talk about Kumihimo. So anybody <laughs> who wants to email me or call me even, I'm always, I'm easy to find. <laughs> Well, this is a beautiful class. And I, I now I understand why you emphasize how everybody's is so different because those images you showed, uh, you really get to use your own creativity to make those, those gorgeous necklaces. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. We appreciate it. This Thanks. is an amazing class. It's a one-day workshop inside out Kumihimo. It is Friday, July the 12th. If you want more information, you can contact Adrian. You can go to the website and see the um, supply list if you're concerned about the materials. But check out this class. Next up, we have Jenny Hockey. Tell your story in Boundweave. It's a three-day workshop. It's Monday through Wednesday. It's July 15th through the 17th. Hi, Jenny. You are muted. There you are. Oh, you're still muted. Turn it off and turn it back on. Let's see what happens. No. Then okay, go like to the little carrot next to the the little symbol that looks like a, um, Okay. Uh, where it says mute. Am I on There now? you go. There you go. I just was on the wrong microphone, I guess. All Sorry. right. Hey. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. And what a great opportunity. I know when I take a class, I'm always wondering what the teacher is like. So this gives people a little bit of a chance um, to find out about the teachers. And I appreciate that. Um, I uh, called this class, Tell Your Story in Boundweave, because students will design their own um, Boundweave figures. And so the uh, op opportunity to make it yours is, is definitely there. Um, so let me get this to go here. Hold on. There we go. Um, so this is a classic bound weave. You may have seen one like this. Um, the classic being the farmer and his wife and the sheep, the spindle and the flax and the and the shuttle. And just some close-ups of the figures there. I always think the sheep look like they have sunglasses on, but they that's just their eyes. But uh, it, the, you can get some delightful figures on a four shaft loom, which just always amazes me how complex you can go with that. So um, in this class, I'm going to talk, of course, about what bound weave is. And lots of people have heard of Krokbrug. It's, it's another kind of bound weave. This one is bound weave figures and it's on four shafts. Um, we'll start out by experimenting with colors and variations. And so that isn't a figure necessarily, but to get to know what, uh, you, what the colors do as you add them in for bound weave. Um, then I will talk about uh, weaving figures. Um, and so this is an example. This actually was one where I developed all the figures because um, this told the story of uh, my family moving into a new house. We were we bought a white house. We were going to have flower gardens and that's my husband, myself and my daughter. So uh, just a nice way to show people that you can do it on your own. Um, lots of times you open up a book about bound weave and you see a figure like this and you say, well, how do I interpret that? And so we will work our way through that on the first day. Um, I will give you some patterns and you can uh, weave up those patterns in the colors that you like. Um, and it's really quite easy once you know how to do it. And then you will design the, the figures that you want. This one happens to be flowers, but you certainly can do people and other objects too. And then um, I wanted to talk about 
the three days because that's a lot in a conference. And I totally understand that that's a lot of time to give um, when you're wanting to do lots of things like shopping and getting to other places. Um, so the first day, um, obviously the introduction and weaving samples. Boundweave is a very slow weave because for every row you are putting in four shots of, uh, of yarn and um, it just builds up beautifully, but one little piece at a time. So the first day you'll you will weave some samples that I give you. The second day you'll design what you want to weave and start to weave that. And then the third day um, continue with your weaving. Um, I'll bring uh, the colors and I ask students to bring two or three skeins of worsted wool that will be their background. And as you can see in this picture here, the background color, um, you can choose a, a, probably a lighter color, but uh, this kind of brown or a gray or white. And we can talk about that too, if you have questions. Um, but in order to get enough of a sample to take something home and to enjoy it and to use my materials while you're there, um, that it's good to have that weaving time. Um, wool yarn can cost quite a bit. And so for you to be able to use my yarns in all those different colors and not have to buy them yourself, I thought was a real advantage. So what you would bring, you would bring a, a pre-warped loom and the warp is quite, uh, quite easy um, that you can go as few as 43 threads. Um, you would bring some stick shuttles or different kinds of shuttles to use um, the two to three skeins of worsted wool. And I'm happy to recommend some companies for that. And then some colored pencils and I'll bring the rest. Um, and like I said, only 43 thread warp, although you can make yours wider if you'd like. And um, you put a pretty short length on the loom because you probably won't weave a huge amount during the workshop. But, uh, and I just wanna to stress too that this is for all levels. If you can warp your loom or have someone help you warp it, bring it. I can teach anyone how to do this with any level of instruction. So, and I really prefer even to, to teach beginners. I love to see the look on people's face when they first see that they can do some things that they didn't think that they could do. So I'm looking forward to the class and can't wait to teach Boundary. Kathy, you're muted. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I think it's wonderful that you're inviting the beginners. I was looking at this thinking, I don't know if I could do this in three days, but after listening to you talk, this must be something I can do. This looks wonderful. Well, thank you. And and the, your $30 fee is pretty great for all that you're providing. And it makes it so much easier to get to the conference. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad to do it. I've, I've discovered that you know, a, a skein of wool yarn could be, you know, 12 to $15. And if you want to build up some colors, you know, that can be quite an investment. So it's great to try it out first and see what you like to do. All right. Tell your story in Bound Weave. It's a three-day workshop. It's Monday through Wednesday, July the 15th through the 17th. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Next up, Beth Ross Johnson. Shashiko, I'm not pronouncing this wrong. I always do. Shashiko Ori, three-day workshop, Monday through Wednesday, July the 15th through the 17th. Hey, Beth. Hello. Um, yeah, so um, Japanese, if you want to get away with pronouncing it, you pretend like it's Spanish and pronounce it that way. It works really, really well. The vowels are almost the same. And then... Um, so what is it? What did I do wrong? I think you put a little bit more emphasis on the second syllable. So uh -huh. it's like, like Spanish, it's a little more even, you know, Sashiko. Sashiko, I did not. You know, you hear people even in Japanese and it sounds like they're saying Sashiko, sashiko or Sashiko. So I don't worry about it. You got it. All right. It. Good enough. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, bound weave is great. Um, <laughs> I just taught a beginning weaving class and started them off with bound weaving. Um, and that's a really fun thing to do. So I'm I'm teaching um, Sashiko Ori, and um, I got a few slides of this um, of what I'm doing. Um, Sashiko, if 
I can't hit my play because there we go. There we go. There you go. Um, yeah. So um, Sasha Co is a form of stitching that's used that was you know used in uh, rural Japan for reinforcing, repairing, um, um, embellishing uh, all fabrics that were you know used by working classes, and um, sometimes it gets translated. Sasha Co gets translated as uh, what do they call it? S stab little stabs. But uh, Yoshiko Wada said it's more like stitched thing. <laughs> ori in Japanese means weaving. So Sashiko Ori is Shashiko weave. And I, once I started looking at the structure, I was glad to find out there was an actual word for it. Um, so it was used traditionally for um, the stitching was used for, you know, work garments. Uh, today, this is from Susan Briscoe's book that I stole his image. Uh, today, it's a pastime that has practitioners all over the world uh, doing sashiko on garments, table runners, Christmas trees, all kinds of things. So um, I started teaching this. I've done a little bit before, but I started teaching it during COVID. I couldn't figure out how to teach weaving online, but stitching, stitching works. So um, I got really interested in these geometric patterns. Um, there's a lot of different styles of sashiko embroidery. And um, when I did that, I realized being a weaver, I could weave this stuff. It'd be a lot easier than stitching all this stuff. So um, started looking at ways to do that. I, I just said my looms were just set up for four harness, setting it up so that the, the uh, horizontal stitches in this were done in the weft. And then I added stitches, you know, with a needle to that to complete the design. And then I figured out I could do it in the warp and add stitches and then I figured out if I just add a couple more harn uh, harnesses to my loom I could do it in both and um, started working on this type of design it's called uh, persimmon flower in uh, in, Sa in Sashiko world and when I got to this I thought you know there's not a whole lot that's new under the sun in weaving so I just started looking through books and looking through books to find examples of this and uh, found some interesting things, which and how I got through them are kind of funny. But um, of course, um, the um, ooh, yeah, there we go. That um, I'm sorry, it's skipping funny. There we go. Uh, of course, the ancient Peruvians did it. They did everything, so they were working in this structure, also a little bit different. Um, and then I had a book of Japanese patterns and it's in there. It was just kind of like I could barely see what that was. And um, then I just went crazy and started experimenting with this. It is. And this is a question that's come up. So I'll um, answer that. It's a supplementary warp and weft structure. That is not the same as having a supplemental warp. So you don't have to have two warp beams. Um, the supplementary warp or weft and or weft refers to the structure of the fabric. So it could be done on a frame loom, it could be done on a backstrap loom, or it could be done on a, a floor loom, a harness loom. So um, it requires at least six harnesses to get these designs, but I know that means eight harnesses uh, that you have to have. And, um, couple of boat shuttles and um, to work in this this particular style of um, Sashiko Ori. Um, I've been doing some other things with it, expanding these patterns and um, doing some in wool. This is a like a heavy blanket fabric, uh, things like that. Um, I've taught a couple of workshops uh, on this. This was a, a week-long workshop I did at the John C. Campbell Folk School. And this student did her project kind of setting it up like a gamp. She had a different threading, in, uh, three different threading. So, um, and then you know how that works. And then when you weave across, you get different patterns going across. So it's really versatile. There's a whole lot you can do with it. Um, this was at the, the Mid-Atlantic Fiber Association Conference, uh, two and a half day workshop, so it can be done. Um, 
the people were trying out different things in there. So that's that's the kind of thing we'll be doing in the workshop. I'll be bringing, I guess y'all can see me. Okay, I'll be bringing warps for everybody. Um, part of the workshop will be designing um, designing the threading. So, um, so that's why I can't give you the whole threading pattern and let you bring the looms warp to class because part of it is learning how to do to design these different patterns, how it all works. And also it's a little tricky how it goes in the read all together. So um, we'll, I'll have these warps for you and the weft and weft yarn, and you'll throw those on the loom and then thread them up. I'm asking that people know their looms and that they know how to read a threading draft and can know how to thread and stuff like that. So. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, uh, mm -hmm. Beth, is yeah. because this requires six harnesses, and if you go, well, I'm going to have a four harness loom right. or whatever, just a reminder, you can rent a loom. Or if you're coming oh, okay. from, you know, you're flying out and you say, I can't bring my loom, you can yeah. rent a loom when you get at convergence. So, um, and you don't have to warp it ahead of time. It's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> so thank you so much. This is for somebody who's been weaving for a little while and they're looking for something different and it looks beautiful. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you. This is a three-day workshop. It's Monday through Wednesday. Sashiko Ori, and I think you'll love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Laura Salome. Introduction to Rug Hooking, a one-day workshop. It's Saturday, July the 13th. Hi, oh, Laura. Turned on. Hi there. I can't pronounce your <laughs> name wrong. Salami. Uh, Salami. It's Salami, but that's no big deal. Uh, I'm, I'm Laura Salami. I live in Albuquerque. Uh, I teach rug hooking and punch needle rug hooking. And I'm president of the Adobe Wool Arts Guild here, New Mexico's only rug hooking guild. Oh. Let me start sharing my here we go, screen. There we go. And come on. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, many leaders that I've heard during this have mentioned that their dedication to the environment and trying to make things better. I'm with them. Rug hooking began as a poor woman's activity in the Maritimes up in Canada and in New England uh, for women to cover their drafty New England floors. Uh, they used feed bags, old clothes, and bent nails. We don't use bent nails anymore, thank goodness. Um, but the spirit of my work is with them because I use primarily repurpose textiles rather than wool. I will use wool. Um, so if you look at that picture right there, you'll see old bed sheets, t-shirts, and some wool yarn. All right. Um, you might not know if you've seen a hooked rug, but you probably have. It might look like this. This was the first rug I ever did. It was in a community ed class in Massachusetts where I came from. Um, it's you hooked using all virgin hand dyed wool fabric strips, which is what you'll typically find in any, uh, hook rugs in the past several decades. I do use some wool and I think wool is important in certain projects, but in general, I like to go back to the ladies who began it all and use what we have, a make do thing. And then I like to share that gospel. Um, we will use wool in this class though, too. We'll use everything. What is rug hooking? Not everyone knows. Um, it's not latch hook, which is the usual thing that people tell me. Um, if you see the picture there at the top, the very the hook on the far left is a latch hook. You can see it has the little latch. The others are various forms of hooked rugs, uh, rug hooks. Um, rug hooking is using a hook to pull a strip of fiber whatever that might be, through a woven backing to create loops. The fibers might include wool, they might include yarn, they might include cottons. It can also include plastic bags, shoelaces, ribbons, stockings, whatever you can make into a, into a strip. What can you do with it? 
Loop by loop, you can create rugs, wall hangings, table runners, bench covers, whatever you come up with in your own imagination. Like I said, I live in New Mexico, so that informs what I create these days a lot of times. So the hatch chili down there was created using mostly bed sheets and t-shirts. Uh, it could go on a table, it could go on a wall. It, could, it was big enough, it could have gone next to a little a bed size rug. The road runner, he was done using wools, cottons, uh, T-shirts, a number of things, and he was stretched so that he can hang on the wall directly. Why would you want to take a class? And what's so great about rug hooking? The colors. The colors are fabulous. You can use anything you can find. You can dye. The textures you can make. So that piece right there on the bench is mostly bed sheets. It's called Red Rocks and Super Fun Sites. The Super Fun Sites are the, the black parts you see, and those are plastic bags. Um, there's no counting. It's not confusing. It's easy to do. It's just one stitch. You pull up loops. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg, especially if you're using recycled textiles. Um, then there's the ability to repurpose the fibers, like I said, to make something beautiful, maybe useful, definitely meaningful for you, and good for the earth. It's fun. My guild out here does a lot of demonstrating in the Botanic Garden in Albuquerque. And people will come up, they'll mention how beautiful everything looks. And then they'll say, that looks tedious. But fiber people know it's not tedious, it's zenning. This workshop will start and maybe even finish something small like a mug rug, which you can see up there, the, the yellow flower. Everything will be provided. You might want to bring some scissors, maybe some paper and a sketchbook. Um, once you learn to pull a loop, you can move into a larger project right away. Uh, nothing to do ahead of time, nothing at all. It's not confusing. I'll bring the hooks, the basic frames, backing, fibers, anything else um, you'll need to make, say the mug rug. Um, while we're concentrating on the hooking technique in this workshop, I'll also demonstrate punch needle techniques so we can look at that. Um, and I guess lastly, I do love to teach other fiber artists mostly because they're usually pretty fearless to experiment with new things. Um, they, I always learn from them, certainly. They're not too worried about rules. You can mix and match your different techniques. Even with this, I combine this with stitching. You could combine it with crochet. But we'll learn a lot from each other in the class. Um, and I think that's about it for now. It's a fun class. That's the most important thing. It looks amazing. And just to remind folks that um, you do have a fee, but that means you just show up, right? You don't have to yeah. bring anything. You don't have to think, do I need this? Do I need that? you just show up. And again, I always want to remind people that this is a great class if you're flying in. You don't have to haul something. Take this class. It'll be easy for you. It's a beautiful class. Thank you so much, Laura. We appreciate it. Introduction to Rug Hooking. It's a one-day class. It's a one-day workshop. It is Saturday, July the 13th. Next up, Angela Schneider. Hello, Angela. You're back with us. We're excited. Beyond Plain Weave, Hand Manipulated Lace. Oh, it's gorgeous. This is a three-hour seminar. It is Friday morning. Hi, Kathy. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, this is a three-hour seminar on Friday morning, and it's more of a three-hour workshop, really. This is hands-on. We've got, uh, if, you've, if you're weaving on... Any loom that can do plain weave, you can take the hand manipulated lace class. We're used to doing, when well, you might be used to doing loom controlled laces like Bronson or Huck, that's not what this is. It's only a plain weave threading required and you're going to manipulate those threads, twist them, gather them and, and so forth to create these particular laces. Let's take a look. Right, so starting off the feature photo for the class, this is two examples of lino lace, and you see that characteristic twist that creates the gap. The white is your basic lino, and the green one is actually a fancy variation of lino that um, 
We're not actually going to do that sample because it's a color and weave also, but I will show you the variation of Lino that is one step away from this. So the several types of laces we're going to be doing, there's Lino, which is the twisting. There's Brooks Bouquet that does a gathering of the warp threads. There's Danish Medallion that does a gathering of the weft threads. And we'll also look at Spanish Lace which is little back and forth sections of weaving that create gaps in between. And then that hem stitching, you know, if you're going to be weaving, you probably know how to hem stitch or you should know how to hem stitch. And you think of it as being an edge treatment, but did you know you can actually use it inside of a piece to create those air spaces to make a lacy effect? So what we're going to do in this workshop is go through all these techniques and try the basic lace unit and some variations so you can understand different ways to make it. And then we'll play with each one, a couple of variations, like changing the size of the lace unit, uh, how many warp threads you're using, how many weft threads you're using, how tall you want it to be, and then how you can stack rows of the lace in order to make patterns. You can line them up, you can stagger them, you can use them in spaces with plain weave backgrounds. And you know, taking those kind of ideas, you can use them as a larger design element. And this class is aimed at anybody that can weave plain weave. You don't have to be a super experienced weaver, but if you are an experienced weaver and you haven't tried these yet, you're welcome to join in. Um, it's for any loom that can do plain weave. So if you've got a table loom or a floor loom set up for plain weave or a rigid head of loom, they're going to work just fine. You just need to be able to make a plain weave shed. Uh, so the other equipment just... that you'll need is... I'm sorry, sorry, Kathy. I'm sorry. This isn't just rigid heddle. If you have it's, a table This loom... one is not. No. Oh, okay, great. You, can, great. you can do this on a table loom or a floor loom. Anything that'll do plain weave, um, not not for pin looms, because you do need to be able to make a shed. Uh, the other equipment you need is two shuttles, because we're going to use that second shuttle with a contrast yarn to make our Danish medallion. You'll need a pickup stick for the lino. You'll need a crochet hook also for the Danish medallion. I left that off the materials list, but it's a pretty simple tool, and I'll have some extras in case somebody doesn't bring one. And a tapestry needle so that we can play with the hem stitching ideas. And the neat thing about this workshop is if you are a rigid huddle weaver and you want to do an all day workshop, you can use the same warp on the same loom, warp it up once, put a little extra length on it and take the, the pickup stick class that I'll be doing in the afternoon. Or if you're a not a rigid huddle weaver, but you're taking a workshop that uses something that can weave plain weave, you can still do this class on that loom. You'll warp ahead of time, but it's a simple process. It's just 48 threads because that's enough to uh, get the technique and get a decent sized sample, but short enough that you can finish it and try another variation of it. And of course, you'll bring your weft yarns and that's in the supply list. And there's no materials fee for this, but there is a handout that will have descriptions of how to do all of these laces with photos. And so you can do like the pieces I have behind me. This is a variation of a of a Danish medallion as a surface embellishment, or you can stack up Brooks Bouquet and get lovely lacy effects like that one. And it's a very stretchy fabric, which is kind of fun. So please come do some hand manipulated lace with me. Well, I love it that you said that that you pointed out that you can use it for other classes because I think people forget that. They think, oh, now I'm not gonna have to have two looms. Now I'm gonna have to have two warps, but that's great. You can, you, can you can stack them up. And these laces are really nice because if you're doing another type of project and you just wanna put a little bit of extra embellishment at the edge, these are great for that sort of thing at the edges of your placemats or at the edges of a scarf and, or do it all over and make a nice lacy curtain. Yeah, those, They're really I fun love those laces. They're just beautiful. Thank you, Angela. Beyond Thank you, Kathy. Weed, hand manipulated lace. This is a three hour seminar. It's Friday morning on July 12th. Next up, we have Rachel Snack. Hi, Rachel. Weaving with spaced warps 
and unconventional yarns. This is a two-day workshop. It's Monday through Tuesday, July the 15th through the 16th. Hey, Rachel. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Awesome. Okay. Let me share my screen because I'm going to share a few slides. Let's go into presenter mode here. Okay. Come on. It's a little slow. Um, okay, so this workshop is super fun for me to teach, and I also think participants have a lot of fun taking it. It's all about exploring unconventional um, materials within weaving. So we're not thinking about cotton and linen and wool. We're thinking about hand-spun bass fibers and paper yarns and things that um, are a little bit more out of the box. Um, so in this course, it's kind of a combination of two different techniques. It's weaving with spaced warps, which is actually leaving gaps in your warp. And then it's pairing that with unconventional materials, like what I just mentioned. Um, so these are some images of my work as an example of some of the ways that I have played with these two techniques together. Um, and so the idea is not only are you trying new yarns, um, you're experimenting with um, the type of fiber you're using, but you're also highlighting that fiber and that can be through structure as well. So um, students can opt to also create a structure within their spaced warps. And let me see. And this is actually student work um, from a past workshop that I taught um, this same exact workshop. Um, if it space warps are not of interest to you at all, I've had students opt to not do a space warp and that's totally fine just to do a solid work. And I'll show some images of my other work that uses these fibers without the space warps as well. Um, but you can see here, these are students that approached it very differently, but the effects are both really beautiful. Um, and so these are mixing of Raimi and paper and um, hemp. And um, I think there's also some banana fiber in there as well. Um, and many different types of paper yarns too. And so then here are some photos of the different materials. So the, the, I think the most fun thing about this course too is that every student will get a materials kit. So it's a $75 material fee, but then you get a kit of all of these fibers and whatever you don't use in class, you get to take home with you and continue to use at home. Um, so this is hand spun Raimi from Japan and on the left it's indigo dyed. And then this is a banana fiber that's hand spun in um, India. And on the left, you can see it woven up in a textile and that's just plain weave with a black warp. So it's a really beautiful textural yarn, even just in plain weave. Um, this is hand spun kudzu from Laos. Um, and on the left, it's woven up in a spaced warp. So you can really see how having those spaces, letting that float happen really highlights the texture of this yarn. Um, it's really simple, but really effective. Um, and in that it's also a mix with linen and some Raimi yarn too. This is a Sasawashi. Um, this is also a paper yarn that's um, created in Japan. Um, and so it comes in all these amazing colors, but then you can see on the right, it's woven and actually in an overshot pattern. Then I manipulated the treadling a little bit, um, but so this weaves up, even though it's a thicker um, paper spun cord, it weaves up beautifully um, within the weft. This is kudzu fiber. So the actual fiber before it's spun into yarn, it's also indigo dyed. And then you can see it in the spaced warp construction. And then this is a paper raffia. And so this is also an overshot, um, but it has this really beautiful crisp texture to it. And then these are just some other examples of my work woven up um, using more of these expen experimental yarns, um, some with spaced warps and some without them. So on the left is paper yarns and on the right is kudzu. On the left here is um, the Rami bark and on the right is um, a true raffia. So not a paper raffia, the actual from the plant um, raffia woven up. And then this is our um, Instagram and my website as well. Thank you. Rachel, this is exciting. The idea of getting to weave with all these different materials. Yeah. This is Yeah, wonderful. that's what it's, it's really about play. And I think too, when people often approach our shop, because we carry a lot of these yarns in my shop weaver house, when a lot of people approach us, 
And they're like, these are so beautiful as objects, as tactile like objects. Just, I want to have them in my studio, but I have no idea how to approach them in an actual woven project. So I think this is a really good way to dip your toes into that and just, um, just play. There you go. Yeah. This is a great workshop weaving with spaced warps and unconventional yarns. Yarns that you've probably not seen anywhere else. It's a two-day workshop. It's Monday and Tuesday. Thank you, Rachel. This looks beautiful. Next up, we've got Sydney. Hi, Sydney. It's Warp Weft Color Pooling. This is a 90-minute seminar. It is Saturday afternoon, July 13th. All right. Um, I'm going to get the screen share going. Okay, whoop, it helps when it doesn't block the whole thing. There we go. All right, um, so uh, I'm gonna be teaching a little lecture on warp and weft color pooling. Um, and it's gonna be a nice short little hour and a half uh, talk about the general principles of how I go about approaching uh, this process. Um, so, these are going to be images of my work um, that I've done over the past several years, kind of really perfecting uh, warp painting and getting it to pull. Um, funnily enough, off of right after Rachel, the picture on the left also has spaced warp pieces in it. So I love that idea. And that workshop sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so uh, what I'll be talking about is how I go about doing this and in many different ways on how to get warps to pool via dyeing them versus like traditional ecot resisting. Um, so this is just a larger image of the piece on the previous slide. Um, and so I'll be talking about different techniques. Um, this one is mostly just like dyed warps and controlling shifting within it. I'll talk about pre-woven painted warps. Um, talk about like trying to like intentionally shift warps to create images or like kind of not so much image but like color placement uh, within it um I'll go over like the equipment that I use and materials as far as like what dyes what kind of things I use to secure warps how the warps are wound um mostly all of this will be focusing on plant fibers versus wools but using the same techniques dyed on wool would be totally possible I've done a little bit of it, but not a ton um, of it. Uh, so here's an example of like what it kind of looks like to a degree. Now we've moved on from painting on the floor to tables over time. It's just sometimes you use the equipment and spaces you have um, to create different things. But the idea is creating some kind of surface that you can paint your warp on and then be able to create patterns and that way it'll play out into the designs that you would like them to see when they're woven up. This is an example of what it looks like once it's on the loom. So you can see uh, the little bit of the big purple circle um, and the green and the teals. This was for a piece that was a hoopa for a wedding and I had to weave it in two panels that then would sew together and have them line up, which is a pretty solid challenge to have fringe lineup and the circles uh, line up together within it. So that was a pretty fun experiment and I really enjoyed doing it. Um, so a lot of this is like modern takes on how to do various warp shifting. Um, and then I will also touch base on weft pooling, which is, as you can see, is just be able to control the, it's the idea of, or similar idea to um, weft ecot, but instead of this one, the way I learned what you got is a little different. Um, but with this one, it, all the edges are on the salvages. You don't have to manipulate them. They will line up as you weave. And there's like a couple of different ways to go about doing that. Um, I'll talk about like the basic planning of how you go about figuring out uh, weft pooling to get it to work or try to get it to work. Um, and various, I'll go through like the very different experiments and the results that I've had um, and how you go about measuring and how different shuttles will re make this happen in different ways. Um, and so it'll be a lot of fun. It's just gonna be a very colorful <laughs> lecture about how to get color to place and interact with one another. 
Um, so I'm excited to do it. So yeah, there we go. That's it. Well, thank you, Sydney. I think this is a great um, class for people who are starting to get into dyeing. I think at first you just kind of play, right? And now people can start looking at and making decisions about their dyeing patterns. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. This is Warp and Weft Color Pulling. It's 90 minutes seminar. It is Saturday afternoon, July the 13th. Next up, Ellen Hess. We hope. <laughs> Ellen had a little trouble getting in, getting in, but I think we've got her. She's going to talk about playing with blocks, summer and winter made easy. We like that made easy part. It's a three-hour seminar. It's Friday afternoon. Ellen, if you can, there you go. Welcome. Okay, hello. Yay, happy to be here. So I'm going to share my screen. And I am going to start my slideshow. Okay, so this is a seminar, a three-hour seminar on Friday, and I've called it Playing with Blocks, Summer and Winter Made Easy. So these are some designs that you're seeing um, by some of my students using this method. Of course, we have to have sheep and lipsticks. So I talk about how to build your own design from the ground up. We talk about the components of summer and winter, um, which is in some ways a lot like overshot in that you have a plain weave background um, and then you're adding your pattern rows in between that. And um, we, we call plain weave tabby sometimes. So, and I love cats, so I had to have that in there. Um, there are somewhat new concepts when you're doing summer and winter. Um, it has tie down ends as overshot does, but the plain weave is not your usual odds against evens. So we talk about why that happens and how to use it. And then there are two approaches to the designing of summer and winter. You can work with a profile draft, which is um, a design, almost like a little thumbnail of what you want your design to look like. And then you can also work with what we call skeleton drafts, which are kind of the background or foundation before you put your design or your profile draft into it. So I was asked to teach summer and winter to relatively new weavers who had not done um, multi-shaft weaving before. And I had to figure out a way to kind of walk them, tiptoe them into the process without it being overwhelming. So um, almost all of the um, pictures you'll see here are works by my students. So when you're doing summer and winter on more than four shafts, you can thread the blocks or the pattern um, groups in more than one way. You can thread them in a straight sequence. And so because summer and winter is a block weave and we're playing with those blocks, you have four threads for each block or each unit of your weave. If you choose to thread it in a straight pattern, you will have your first block, which we usually call block A, threaded one, three, two, three. The second block will be threaded one, four, two, four, et cetera, depending on how many shafts you have available to play with. So this um, weaving on the right is an example of a um, kind of a geometric, almost abstract, um, on a straight block threading. You can also choose a point block sequence where it is a straight threading and then it comes down again just like a regular point draw would, only this time instead of one thread each, it's little groups of four threads that um, behave as one. Once you've chosen that, and sometimes the criteria is what you want your design to look like. 
And so um, I like doing conversationals, which are little pictures. So a lot of my, um, a lot of the things I demonstrate with are pictures. So this is a seasonal image of little acorns. On the left, you see the actual fabric. On the right, um, this is a um, computer-aided design of a point threading. The advantage of using a point block threading is that it makes your design twice as big. But depending on what you would like to work with, what you want to design, you can pick either one. So here is that same acorn motif um, with some color added. Um, and so if you, if you want something that is symmetrical, you will pick a point block sequence. So my, what makes this system work is that we start with something called a skeleton lift plan um, or a skeleton peg plan. It is what you would use to weave if you were working on a table loom so that each row reading across is one combinations of the shafts lifting. Um, and so if you can create this incomplete draft, it's kind of like your scaffolding. And once you have that done, you will um, be able to add your pattern in pretty easily. So the first thing we'll do is to sketch out a little design motif on graph paper. Um, this example is for an eight shaft summer and winter. Uh, so shafts one and two are reserved to be tie down uh, warp threads and they're not part of our pattern motif. So here I've sketched in uh, half of a house. So this will be on a point block threading and you can use colored pencils or pencils. Um, then you will take that and add your pattern shafts to it. Um, and then you can change the colors. You can pick the different background pattern. Um, so we're kind of building it from the ground up. Um, so you don't need to bring anything. If you want to bring your own graph paper, that is just fine. Um, I will have some graph paper for you to work on too. And you need something to draw with. I recommend using a pencil um, so you can erase if you choose to edit your design. And, um, and we will design that. If you do use any weaving software and care to bring your laptop, you're welcome to do that. And then we can look at how that works um, in your laptop. Thank so you. if you have any questions, please, you can contact me at elliweave at gmail.com. And these are um, also some of my students' um, summer and winter designs. These are beautiful. Thank you so much, Ellen. We You're appreciate welcome. it. You're what, a, what a great looking class. What some interesting things you can make. Playing with blocks, summer and winter made easy. This is a three hour seminar and it's Friday afternoon, July 12th. What amazing classes we got to see today. And there's more to choose from. 150 seminars and workshops from 90 minutes to three hours, one, two or three day workshops. Just a reminder, you might want to get your CVP. It will uh, give you that 25% discount, but be sure you buy your CVP before you buy your classes. Registration is open uh, for wespendie.org slash sessions. You can find more information. And again, we hope we'll see you this summer, July the 11th through the 17th in Wichita. Thank you so much. We have another program tomorrow. I hope you'll join us then. Bye-bye.